Thank you, team. Take your Bible. Go to Matthew 22, and we'll begin reading this morning in verse 34. Matthew 22, in a moment we'll read through verse 30, uh, begin in 34 and read through verse 40, a message entitled, Teaching a Lawyer How to Love. Well, welcome on Valentine's Day morning. Glad that uh, you're here. You know, we have days when... Uh, uh, it's not a holiday, but a calendar day falls on a Sunday. It's happening twice this year with Valentine's Day on a Sunday. Also, July 4 falls on Sunday this year. And so those days come uh, into our mind. And I was thinking oh, about Valentine's Day and uh, getting ready two weeks from today. Sean will be preaching next Sunday. And then I'll start a series on the church for five weeks after that. Uh, but this morning, uh, I asked one of the young preachers as we were meeting the other Sunday night, I said, well, if it's Valentine's Day, what would you preach on? And one of them said, well, if I was just being real cheesy, I'd preach on 1 Corinthians 13. I said, well, I won't do that. And, uh, uh, but as I began to think and pray and say, Lord, where should we go on this Valentine's morning? I kept coming back to this text in Matthew 22. Verse 34, and when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Valentine's. Uh, some people say it has a Christian context from the third century. Uh, there are all kinds of traditions and myths and stories that uh, are told about a man who was uh, martyred for the gospel. Uh, his name was Valentine, uh, that he wrote a note to the man who had him in jail for the gospel and uh, sharing about the love of God with this daughter of this man and signed it, your Valentine, and that, that has rolled down to our age and how much... Uh, truth there may be in fiction in that we don't know but that's become part of who we are out of a Christian context uh, of the third century Rome and then there's the pagan side uh, of Valentine and uh, there is the sexual connotation Cupid and all of that that comes rolling uh, in together but no doubt about it, people wear red, they give cards, uh, they draw hearts, uh, they share candy. Uh, we do a lot of things. Some of you men did it this morning. Uh, if you didn't, then you messed up. But uh, uh, this is Valentine's Day, and so it's an extra day when we uh, send a card or a gift or something, uh, as it just ushers romance uh, into the culture uh, on this day. With that, my mind kept driving back to this lawyer. Now, he's not an attorney like our culture. He's a keeper of the Old Testament law. He's a scribe. He's a writer of the law. He came, he was testing Jesus and said to our Lord, What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus spoke to him these words as he quoted from the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 5, and then he quoted uh, from Leviticus 19, 18. And he put those two together and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. That's the great commandment. And the next one, like it, out of Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this morning, I'm not going to say much new to you. You know these. 
My challenge is going to be to you your application of what you already know. Love God. Love your neighbor. So let's think about those two things on this Valentine's morning. Give an invitation for somebody to come to Christ, for another to be baptized, for a family or a couple or just one somebody you to come and join this church and put your heart and life together with us. Master, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord. The Shema. Every little Jewish boy, every little Jewish girl learned Deuteronomy 6, 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is thy God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Every kid learned that. If you lived at my house as a kid, you learned that. We taught the Shema to our children growing up. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You you, you give him not third place. You don't give him second. You you give him first place. Colossians 1, verse 18 says it this way. He's the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might become to have First place, King James says the preeminence, the preeminent place, the first place, and not second place, not third place. He's, he's not on the list. No, no. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's first. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You give him first place in honor. You give him first place in in influence. It's a love which dominates your emotion. That's your heart. It's a love which dictates your action. That's your soul. It's a love that directs your thoughts. That's your mind. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. The Old Testament writer of Proverbs chapter 3, many of us use this as a life verse. In Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with half your heart. Well, no. You you trust him with all your heart. You, You don't lean some on your understanding, but in all, not party ways, in every way. You acknowledge him, and he'll make your paths straight. Hmm. First place. So, church, you, you know this, but let me ask you. Does Jesus have first place in your heart? Is he the preeminent one? Well, number one doesn't even have a place in your heart. Are you a saved man or woman? Before you can make him Lord, you, you, you need to call on him to be your saved. Let me tell you today, friend. If if you'll ask Jesus to save you, he will today. Had a man after church today came by to see me today. He said, Pastor, thanks for encouraging me. He said, I've never shared my faith before. Never, ever have I shared my faith, and you've been stirring me up. He said, I was at the gas station the other day. I'm pumping gas, and a guy walked up to me and, and, and said, I need some money. Can you help me? He said, it always makes me mad when they do that. But he said, something I'd been hearing in church tendered my heart, and, and he he said, I looked at the guy, and he said, yes, I will help you, but you have to listen to me for two minutes before I help you. And, and he said, okay, I'll do it. And he said, I did the best I could in sharing the gospel. And he said, let me tell you, the man, he said, he might have been playing game with me, Pastor. I don't know, but he prayed to receive Christ right there at the gas pump. And then I helped him out. He said, I, I don't know. He said, he may do that with everybody. I, I don't know. But it was for me to share my gospel faith, to, to put forward that Jesus was first. He said, I'd always just been in anger and said, get out of here. But he said, God did something in my heart. I said, yeah, I know what happened. Jesus moved into first place. Is he the first place in your heart? Is he your savior? If you've never been saved, in a few minutes when John sings, I want you to walk down here and come to that table and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I want you to go out there to a table in the foyer. If you're at home and you're watching online, if you're in your car, on your way to Mississippi to pick up your daughter, I don't know. I know there's a deacon doing that this morning because he told me he was. But I don't know where you are, but you're listening and watching. 
and you've never received Christ, do it today. Come unto Christ and bow before the Lord. Is he first place in your heart? Well, but now secondly, not only you give him the first place in your heart, you ought to give him the first hour of the day. Amen. First. First thing you do in the morning, you ought to drop on your knees. You ought to open the Word of God. You say, Pastor, I never prayed an hour in my life. Well, give him the first 10 minutes. Try with 15. First hour of the day. Give him the first day of the week. Come to worship. Be a part of the church. Join the family. Give him the first portion of your income. Bring your tithe under the storehouse. Make a hundred, give ten. Make a thousand, give a hundred. Give him first consideration in every decision. Not what your wife thinks. She'll love you, but she won't take you to the right place every time. Hmm? You give him first consideration in every choice this job this place this action what does king jesus say Mm -hmm. i shall never forget it i was saved i was 10 years old i'm sitting in the pew at 17 i i will never forget the day that, that god dealt with my soul and said Take your sport vision off the throne and move me as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I said, I ain't going to do it. No. But God kept hammering me. And finally, I bent to bow and say, yes, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I'm not standing here to tell you today that I keep Jesus first in everything I've ever done. But that's my goal. And from that day, I drew that line. There, there's a young man who's a part of our church today. I remember teenagers. I remember him as a kid growing up. He grew up in his church. He's a businessman now in our community. He played ball at a local high school. I, I always remember. He's a pretty good athlete. I remember the word came to me. He said he's not going to play his senior year because he, he believed that Jesus told him he should lay that down in order to pick up the cross and follow Christ. I thought to myself, I, I'm glad God didn't ask me to do that. Boy, I don't know if I could have done it. But he didn't. I've always admired him for that, that I watched him move Jesus into first place. He laid that down. He may not call you to do it that way, but, but he will call you to put Jesus first. He, the Word of God says that. The application of it, I don't know. But when he says make him Lord, he means make him Lord. You remember Peter? Hmm. He denied the Lord before the rooster crowed twice. And when the Lord met him on the beach, he asked him thrice, Peter, do you love me? Hmm. Peter, Do you love me? Let me ask you one more time, Peter. Do do you love me? Well, if you do, tend my lambs, feed my sheep, help my flock. Olive, do you love me? That's what Christ is calling out to us today. Church. Do you love me? You say, oh, Lord, you know I do. Well, then feed my sheep. Find my flock. Tend to the lambs. Grow them up. Oh, in Revelation 2 and verse 4. I have something against you, church, is what the Spirit said. You have left your first Look, Jesus used to be Lord, but, but now you've kind of wandered off. And it used to be he was king, but, but you, you've left him. You've turned and wobbled off. Hmm. He says, 
If you've left your first love, there's only one action for you to take. Remember where you left from. Repent and come home to me. Crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Lord of all. Yes, amen. As I've said again and again from this pulpit, he's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. You hear it, you say, Preacher, I'm tired of hearing that. Well, move him to first place and you'll love it. Yes. First, foremost, above all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love him. Love him. In just a minute, I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come love him. Bow, King of kings. Lord of lords. Some of you need to go to the baptism. Just like that's where you start, your first place of proclamation. I, I, I love him. Jeremy asking those people, have you professed faith in Christ? Yes, I baptize you. Dead to Christ, alive to self. It's your first step. First place. I say, preacher, I'd be scared. I'm scared of water. Listen to me. I have this proof. There has never in the history of Olive Baptist Church been a person drowned in the baptistry. Not one. <laughs> We've been doing this 130 years. You may be the first. <laughs> but if you do, you go straight to glory if you know the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Put your fear aside and make Jesus Lord walk in that water. If you drown, I'll fire the preacher that baptizes you. I guarantee you I'll do it. Oh, don't let fear, don't, don't let fear keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Love the Lord. And then secondly, he said, there's a second commandment, and that is to love your neighbor. He quotes here Leviticus 19:18. We find this again and again in the New Testament. Here Jesus quotes it. Paul quotes it in Romans 13, verse 9, in Galatians 5, in verse 14, and then James quotes it in James chapter 2, in verse number 8, when they say to love, love, love the Lord. Quote in Leviticus, don't take vengeance, don't bear a grudge, love your neighbor as yourself, I'm the Lord. You ever tried to hold a grudge? Hmm. You, you can't hang on to it. You, you get splinters in your hand try to hold a grudge. Your heart will get hard. It's hard. Oh, no. You're just doing yourself harm, not them. Don't bear the grudge, but love your neighbor as yourself. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to love ourselves. Mm -mm. Now, this is as close as it gets. Love your neighbor as yourself. How, how many of you think highly of yourself? Say amen. That's pretty weak because you was afraid to say it, wasn't you? Well, God made you. God loves you. It's okay to appreciate you. You, you have a healthy self-image. That's good. What he's saying here is the way you're going to take care of yourself, you'll take care of your neighbors. You're not going to do yourself harm. You got up this morning you came to church, you cleaned up a little bit, combed your hair, we're grateful. Some of you didn't take very long, but uh, uh, we're grateful that you cleaned up and washed this stuff out from under your fingernails and got ready. So you care for yourself. We're presentable. Not outlandish. Not boastful and pride, no, no. Just, but care, well, the way you're going to care for, care for your neighbor. Love your neighbor like that. See, without God, we become angry at the unteachable. Without God, we become pessimistic about the unimprovable. And we become callous toward mankind. There was another lawyer in the Bible. He's in Luke 10. He came to Jesus and he asked this question. 
Luke 10, 25, this lawyer stood up. He put Jesus to the test. And he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked the lawyer, he said, well, what's written in the law? How's it read to you? And the lawyer here, Jesus quoted it in Matthew. But in Luke, the lawyer quoted it. said, well, the law said. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and do what? Your neighbor is yourself. And then he asked a smart aleck question. He said, well, who's my neighbor? Trying to excuse himself. And Jesus told him a story. If you've been in vacation Bible school ever, or you go to Sunday school, you know this story. The world knows this story. He said, well, who's my neighbor? He said, well, a certain man, and we don't know who this man was. We don't know if he's Jew or Gentile, but we believe he's a Jewish man. Left Jerusalem up at the three hills and came down that old winding road. I've been down it a few times to Jericho. It's a scary trip, even in a bus. Kind of a winding road going down to the valley where Jericho is. And on the way down, that man was, and he got robbed, beaten, left to die. Jesus said a priest came by. He looked and said, hmm, I don't know none of that. And he walked by on the other side. Then a Levite came by. A priest and a Levite. Every priest is a Levite, but not every Levite is a priest. They're all out of the tribe of Levi. But the priests take care of keeping the flame burning and take care of the altar, and they had priestly duties. The Levites did other things. One lived off the tithe. The other ones lived off the offerings. A priest would have, in our eyes, been a little higher up. I often preach this, John, and say the pastor came, then the minister of music came. The pastor said, I ain't doing it. Left. Levite came. Went by on the other side. Why did they do that? Well, they might have said, you know, I've already done my duty. I've been working for 30 days up at Jerusalem taking care of everybody's sacrifice. It's time for me to get home after a while, you know. I mean, by the way, it's Valentine's Day, and I got a wife and kids. And so he skirted by on the other side. Or maybe he said, well, you know, somebody else will do it. I know that the Levites are coming behind me, and I'm going to go on. One of them will take care of him. Maybe somebody else. Or maybe he says, you know, if I kneel down here, that robber may still be in the woods. I don't know. He says, I may get it too. Or it may have entered his mind to say, you know, if I'm kneeling down here and somebody comes by, they think I did it. A false accusation. I don't want to be involved. I'd just rather not. And he passed by. A Levite. Then the Bible says a Samaritan came. That's why we think this man's a Jew, because it adds the oomph to the story. And the Samaritan saw the certain man, and the Bible says he felt compassion. You'll never love your neighbor till the Spirit of God stirs your heart. And then the Bible says he came and bent down and bandaged up his wounds. He didn't just feel it in his soul. He got dirty with his hands. He picked him up and carried him down to the Jericho Motel 6. (laughs) Took him in. Said, take care of this, brother. I'll pay for it. And if it costs you more than I'm paying when I come back, I'll pay the rest of it. He didn't just feel it in his heart. He didn't just get his hands dirty, but he opened up his wallet and met his needs. And Jesus crossed his arms. It doesn't say that in the text, but he did. 
And then he looked at him, he said, which of these three you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell at the robber's hand? And the lawyer, this guy had a PhD. He's a smart man. He said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, say those words with me there on the screen. Jesus said to him, what? Go. One more time. What did Jesus say to him? Trent, you've never loved your neighbor till you go and do Till till you feel it in your heart, till you bend your knee and get your hand dirty, till you open your wallet and love your neighbor like you love yourself. Listen to me, church. The church's true and authentic organizing principle is mission. It's why we're here. And when the church is in mission, it is the true church. What happens is we get more concerned about us and gathering and fellowshipping that it overshadows the going. And when we're more interested about ourselves than we are the field, we cease being the church. I'm not saying we don't take care of them. I I spend my week getting ready for this. I study to do this. I pray to do this. John doesn't just throw this together on Saturday night. Well, he has a time or two, but (laughs) they work at this. Amen. So it'll be good when we come together and we pray in the fire of God fall. But it's not all about in here. Until the church is in mission mode, it's not the church. It's called loving your neighbors. Now you got to love the saints. Amen. And often it's harder to love the saints than it is to love that crowd. Because you know these people better. But here we're supposed to give each other a break. Love the people. Love God, love your neighbor. I was 17 high schoolers. I was 17. I'd never shared my faith. I I got saved when I was 10. And then 17, our pastor just kept saying, you ought to tell somebody. Hmm. Claude Wheeler taught me. And then we had this discipleship school 400 people came monday tuesday wednesday night 400 of us came and they taught us how to share the gospel and they said now when you come back on thursday night write the name of a lost person down gonna put it in a big bowl down on the communion table and then at the end we'll all draw a name out and we're gonna go out and practice well on thursday night 200 came not 400 so i often say baptists are that way everybody wants to know about half want to do something So I went by and I pulled out that name and I'm 17 years old. I'm just about to be a senior in high school and it's in the summer and I look at that name and she is a sophomore cheerleader. My Lord, she looked like Bathsheba. (laughs) She looked good to me, the Bible said about her. Delilah. Woo! Long blonde hair, an identical twin. I went and sat down. I said, Lord, I got to get rid of this. 
And the pastor stood up and he said, there'd be no exchanging of names. <laughs> wow. I said, well, how are we going to get out of it? I just sat there. And then they teamed us up. I'm, all, I'm 17, about to be 18. And they gave me George Sizemore as my partner. He is 70 years old. I said, Lord, I am not going to this girl's house with this old man. I couldn't get out of it. We got in the car and George drove. We went to the house where he had his address, knocked on the door. Nobody home. We walked back to the car. I'll never forget it. I was walking back to the car. I said, Lord, I want one just like George. Just don't let anybody be home. I, that's the way I get out of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got to the house, knocked on the door. Her mother came to the door. I asked if she was there, and she said no. And I thought, hallelujah. (laughs) But before I could say a word, she said, but her sister is. And I heard the Spirit of the living God say, I can't even tell them apart. Go on in. They're identical. (laughs) And it's the truth, if I ever said it, I went in, George sat way over there, I sat down, she sat down next to me, it's a Thursday night, she was cleaning up, she had her hair in rollers, big orange juice can size rollers, she didn't look so good, but I sat down and, and I went through the plan, of, I never looked at her. I said, law number one, God loves you. Law number two, law, and I just went through, read the scripture, never looked at her. And I got to the end, you had to say, does this make sense to you? And when I turned and says, does this make, tears were coming down her face. She asked Jesus to save her that night. And the first time I ever tried it, it worked. Not every time I've ever shared it does it work. But the first time. And you know it was the eloquence of the presentation that did it. (laughs) You know it was the willingness of my soul is what turned her heart. (laughs) It was the sovereign God that appointed a time for that young girl to say yes to Jesus. The first time I ever tried it. And let me tell you, friend, If you'll ask God to use you, he'll wear you out. He'll keep you so busy. You won't win everybody because everybody's not going to get saved. But he'll use you, not always to win the loss, sometimes just to help people. You'll be amazed when you share the gospel how many Christians you meet that just need an encouraging word. And it'll build them up. In the inner man. Rabbi, what is the greatest command? There were 603 commandments that the rabbis had. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said out of the 603, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And there's another like it. 1A, love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen to this preacher. We're going to do two things. We're going to give invitation. I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to put on a mask. And I'm going to invite you to come say yes to Jesus. I'm going to invite you to come. Join this church today. Somebody ought to join this church today. I'm going to invite you to come be saved today. I'm going to invite some of you just to come home to God today. You don't even need to talk to me. You just come to the altar. And we're going to help you. 
Just before we do that, if you are seated with your spouse, like I'm not right now, Larry's not, but you are. I, I, if you're a couple, I want you just to stand. Let's just stand. If you're a couple, not everybody's a couple today, but if you're here as a couple, just stand up. It is Valentine's Day. So look right here at the pastor. Sir, do you commit yourself to live with her until you die? Amen. Ma'am, do you commit to live with him till the day of death? Now, through that mask, I want you to kiss her. <laughs> Love. It's, it's a day of romance. But this is not the greatest love. You ought to love your spouse because everybody ought But the greatest love, do you know the word worship literally means to kiss toward God? That's what it means. That you give your affection unto the Father first and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's all stand. Father, draw us up to yourself today. Help us love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And use us as a church to turn inside out going into the highways and hedges, compelling them to come in. Make us a church that is in mission, involved, in gear, going. Now, Lord, draw people, save, add, encourage.